All right, well, uh, good afternoon. I guess uh, hopefully you guys have had enough coffee. You can survive another uh, uh, session. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I've never been here before. It's a, a nice place to have a conference. So I'm going to tell you about uh, Majoranas uh, and uh, Majoranas with electrons, not Majoranas with spin. And uh, before I get started, let me just kind of uh, put it in context uh, what I want to tell you today and why uh, what I'm excited about, uh, about the most recent results that I hope to show you as we go along here. So I think there are now, uh, by now, many different platforms in which we can realize topological superconductors uh, in materials, for example, in systems based on topological insulators, systems based on semiconductor nanowires, and uh, atomic chains that I'm going to talk about here uh, today. And I think that uh, the, what I would call the charge signatures of Majorana fermions, these zero energy modes uh, from spectroscopic measurements, have, have been seen in a lot of different experiments, including ours, which I'll, uh, which I'll review as we go along here. And I think the, the, the question now in the field is, is this somehow uh, some sort of a fine-tuned trivial state that goes to zero energy, and somehow we're just fooling ourselves to think that this is actually a Majorana zero mode. So uh, experimentalists are looking beyond uh, these zero energy modes and trying to find ways in which we can find some unique properties uh, of Majorana and uh, perhaps uh, demonstrate these properties, uh, perhaps the fact that maybe they are non-local uh, objects and uh, there are experimentalists looking uh, in that uh, direction. And what I want to tell you about today is a sort of spin polarized measurement, uh, which as I will go along here, I hope to convince you that uh, we think that maybe this is actually at least a litmus test uh, for, uh, for Majoranas. If you don't have this signature, what you're looking at is definitely my, not a Majorana fermion. Uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, this signature seems to have some relations theoretically at least to the non-local nature of Majoranas, the fact that Majorana emerged from a band. And uh, at the end, if I have time, uh, I want to show you beyond the atomic chains that some of you have seen me talk about. We actually also found a new platform uh, in which we can have strong spin-orbit coupling in superconductors and also use that uh, as well for topological superconductivity. So before I uh, go very far, let me tell you who's responsible for all the work. This is a project that's in very close collaboration with my colleague Andre Bernevik and his group uh, and even some of his uh, former people at Princeton, our, our chairman Titus was part of this effort. And in my lab, the work uh, got started by Stevan and Ilya who have moved on and some of the results have recently been from Ben and Malika. Uh, then the spin resolve measurements that I'm going to focus on towards the end of this talk is from uh, Sangjung and Yonglong. And we've long benefited from interacting uh, with uh, Alan McDonald and his group at UT Austin. So my group in general just uses STM to look at different materials. And in this field, uh, what we have fun with is the fact that STM is the technique in which you can combine structural information with spectroscopic information. So obviously much of topological phases is determined by the having edge bones and boundary states and having SDM to look at boundary states uh, it, you know, it gives you a way to at least know where things are coming from. And in fact, uh, this is how we're going to use it to look at topological superconductivity and Majoranas. So combining spectroscopy with imaging. So this is a slide that uh, is uh, probably too elementary even for this audience, but let me flash it. This is, of course, the famous uh, Kitayev chain model, uh, where Kitayev wrote down a very simple model in which you consider spinless electrons. And of course, if you have spinless electrons and you want to pair them, they have to pair in the P wave channel, which means that they cannot pair on site because of the fact that they're fermions. And he showed us that basically this model has two phases, both of which are superconducting, uh, with a gap inside the bulk, and one of which has a boundary mode, uh, which is a Majorana fermion, half electron and half hole. Now, if you have read this paper carefully, uh, uh, which I have, uh, you, you find that many of the things that have later come to be proposals uh, for how you create a Katarov chain is actually buried in, inside the words of this, uh, uh, in this paper, including consideration of spin orbit interaction, uh, Zeeman interaction. He basically draws this phase uh, this uh, band structure, which you basically have to construct in order to induce superconductivity on this Fermi surface to create uh, his 1D model. 
Now, interestingly, uh, when I read this paper uh, after the work at Delft, I noticed the, a, a, a sort of a throwaway line uh, which Katayev said, oh, maybe you can even use mid-gap states. In his case, he talks about P-wave superconductor, but then we thought about what about S-wave superconductors? And this is where we uh, came to this problem. Uh, our work is related to a long line of work by other people considering combination of magnetism and superconductivity. We basically consider what will happen if you put a chain of magnetic atoms on a surface of a superconductor. Now, initially, we thought about this in the context of a Shiba states that magnetic impurities induce inside the superconductor. So if you have a magnetic impurity, it introduces Shiba state. If you have a chain of them, it introduces a band of Shiba states. And uh, together with Andre, we consider what will happen if these uh, magnetic moments have a spiral configuration. And this is basically a Shiba calculation for a chain of magnetic impurities. And we found that, indeed, as you have the magnetic moment be strong enough at some value of magnetic moment, the system basically develops a topological phase. And in this topological phase, the gap closes and opens. And inside there, you have a zero mode that is isolated to edge of this uh, spin chain, which is spiral. But of course, uh, uh, when we sent this paper uh, to be reviewed, uh, one of the reviewers said that this is a ridiculous idea that nobody would ever try such an experiment to put chains on a superconductor. And furthermore, uh, correctly, the reviewers point out that it's pretty difficult to get a spiral magnetic moments on a superconductor or in a, on a metal. Uh, but regardless, this is a ridiculous, uh, uh, so our paper didn't make it into PRL, which was just fine. But then we realized that, in fact, you don't need a spin spiral, but what you need is basically a superconductor with strong spin orbit coupling. And as a result of this exercise, we realized that, in fact, uh, is a much more simpler way of thinking about how you can get topological superconductivity if you just go back to the band structure of a, of a simple ferromagnet. So here's a simple ferromagnet with d orbitals. You have a large exchange interaction. This is your uh, minority band near the chemical potential. And of course, nobody in their right minds would think about introducing uh, superconductivity on this spin polarized band unless you have some sort of a triplet pairing mechanism. But if you have an S-wave superconductor, and that S-wave superconductor has strong spin orbit coupling, you can think of the spin of the electrons along these bands as not just being all perpendicular. Okay? Because of that spin orbit coupling, you can think about the spins, if you like, as being slightly canted. And that canting is all you need to use the S-wave superconductor to induce superconductivity on this band. And then later we realized that the beauty of this system uh, is that basically you're almost guaranteed, almost, to have an odd number of bands crossing the Fermi energy because the exchange interaction guarantees for you to move the other spin texture far away in energy uh, from the chemical potential. So unlike some of the other systems, like the nanowire systems at Delft, uh, which has the advantage that maybe you can use electrostatic potential to tune in and out of uh, topological phase, the advantage of this system is that if you manage to introduce superconductivity on this chain, it is likely to be topological. All right, so what are the signatures you look for? Essentially, of course, zero energy modes at the end of the chain. But also, if you're in the middle of the chain, you can look for these Shiba bands. Uh, which are these impurity bands that are introduced by this magnetic, uh, magnetic line uh, into, into your superconductors. The spin properties of these is uh, one of the things that I want to focus on uh, as we go towards the end of this talk. So how did we realize this in the lab? We started with lead. Uh, lead is uh, one of the best understood superconductors. And you can basically atomically uh, prepare this atomically clean surface of lead. And we chose the lead 110 surface, which has a natural anisotropy. Uh, atoms basically in one direction are further apart and in the other direction. It gives you a nice template to create one-dimensional structures. And very easily what we do is that we just evaporate iron at room temperature, essentially, on the surface of lead, and we just anneal it slightly. And when we do that, basically the iron atoms self-assemble uh, between the rows of the lead uh, structure underneath in a one-dimensional line. Okay. So uh, now the question is, does this system have all the required properties uh, to realize the theoretical model that I showed you about? So the first step is to think about, uh, to measure the spin properties of, of these chains. So to do that experiment, we use spin polarized STM. 
which is you use a uh, tip at the end of which you have a magnetic moment which you can manipulate with a vector magnetic field in our system. This has some local, if you like, uh, an isotropy which you like to sit in, but you can flip it up and down. And I'm going to talk a lot about spin polarized measurements towards the end of this talk. So this is the, this is the kind of the setup that is used uh, for these experiments. And this is all prepared in situ together with the film uh, and the magnetic chains all at the same time. Now, when you tunnel from these uh, magnetic tips, we know a lot about these magnetic tips. It takes just about a quarter of Tesla to uh, twist switch this, their magnetization. And, and when we do that, we basically get the classic curve of tunneling between uh, two ferromagnets. Okay? So this is what happens when you make measurements uh, on top of these uh, magnetic chains. Now, if you go around, of course, we make many, many chains at the same time on the same surface. If you go around, you'll find that 50% of the chains are pointing up and 50% of the chains are pointing down uh, as being measured with this you know, polarized STM. So the color scale here is the coloring added uh, from the tunneling conductance on top of the topography uh, that is measured with the STM. Now, it is not to say that the magnetism is completely uniform. It's all up, up, up. It could have some... Uh, you know, uh, sort of orientation as you go along, but all of that is good within our story of trying to look for topological superconductivity. All we want is not just purely all spin up. But what about the substrate? So with the substrate, you can take the STM, which has this spin polarized tip now, and move away from this magnetic chain and tunnel into the substrate, in, in this case lead, which is not magnetic. And you can make a measurement of tunneling as a function of applying a magnetic field with this vector magnet. And what you find is that the tunneling density of states basically uh, gets suppressed as you pull the magnetization of the tip out of the surface of the sample. Now, this is, this is a feature we, we first we thought we had discovered, uh, you know, an effect of sort of the spin uh, orbit coupling, but this is actually something that was seen before in semiconductors. People tunneling from iron to gallium arsenide into a gold contact on the other side. They could see as they reoriented the iron uh, magnetization, they could see curves just like this having to do with the spin orbit coupling of the barrier, in this case gallium arsenide. So we can actually see the impact of spin orbit coupling on the surface of lead uh, in our experiment. Of course this is not that surprising. Lead is a very heavy element and, and uh, this is, shouldn't come as a big surprise. So we have all the ingredients and therefore it's not a big surprise that if you now have superconductivity in lead at low temperatures or low magnetic field uh, which introduces a gap onto uh, the, the, the chain. Uh, if of course you have these Sheba bands associated with the presence of magnetic chain on top of this superconductor. At either end of the chain, here on top or at the bottom of this chain, you can clearly see a zero bias peak uh, measured in the, in the spectrum. Now, what I like to do is show the data to you in this particular way uh, because, of course, the end of the chain is different than the middle of it. And having Sheba states in the middle of the chain, you should, in fact, do see them knowing about the end of the chain, which, in fact, they do. You can see that this Sheba band basically uh, sort of moves over and uh, as you go towards the end. But what's remarkable is this zero bias state in this, this is an earlier data. I'll show you higher resolution in a minute. This zero bias state comes almost out of nowhere uh, and it pops its head up on either end of the same chain. We have basically seen this in uh, hundreds uh, of different chain, as, uh, iron chains that uh, they have uh, measured in our lab. Now what's nice about lead is that you can just simply turn off superconductivity with the application of 100 millitesla. And with that, of course, you get rid of the superconducting gap. And with that, you get rid of all these features, including the zero energy state. So this is a nice test because at 100 millitesla, you're hardly doing anything with Zeeman energy. And of course, it can make you convinced that this zero bias peak is not due to something like the Kondo effect, which would only be enhanced in the normal state. All right. So now we have extended these early measurements doing experiments at very low temperatures where the, uh, basically the same experiment is being reproduced in another instrument which can get down to two min 20 millikelvin. The electron temperature is still around 150 or 200 millikelvin. But the, the temperature are cold enough that you can actually see uh, even features, uh, very fine features in the substrate. For example, you can see that lead actually has two, two, two gaps having to do with two superconducting 
uh, two, two Fermi surfaces. This has been known before. And what's nice is that you can basically reproduce the same uh, experimental measurement. And now we can put a bound that our splitting is, uh, you know, somewhere south of 45 micro EV. And you can see that there are a lot of features in the data. This has to do with the fact that the, there are lots of Shiba bands uh, inside our chain. And it may also have to do with the fact that these chains, although they look uh, perfect, uh, they are not atomically perfect because the iron and lead do not have the same lattice constant. So there is always some incommensuration having to do with uh, uh, fitting iron on top of, of lead. But uh, what's nice is that now with this high resolution, you can really see uh, sort of everything that, that is there. So here is our zero energy mode that's living there. And you can see there are other end states at the end of this chain, uh, which is, comes from uh, all the details of this potential. Uh, and also you can see the large Shiba band, which is uh, dispersing and changing. Now it turns out that uh, you can put in the details of the structure of this chain in a calculation, and this was done in a recent paper that just appeared. Uh, you can actually mimic a lot of the experimental results uh, if you basically put in the fact that you know something about the structure of these chains. And you can see that there are lots of uh, Shiba bands even in the calculations. Now it turns out that this zero bias peak is very robust uh, in, in these calculations as well as in the experiment. Whereas the, whereas the gap that you would get from a P-wave gap, uh, it's, it's actually quite uh, sometimes hard to see even in the calculations. So the energy broadening here is about 90 micro EV, so that also accounts for uh, perhaps what we don't see uh, as a completely zero bias, zero, uh, away from the end of the chain. All right. So with these higher resolution experiments, we also discovered that uh, despite our original report where you could just see one big giant uh, region near the end of these chains where uh, the zero bias peak was maximum, we see this very odd uh, 2i feature for where the zero bias energy uh, state uh, lives. So this puzzled us for quite some time until we, we started to really think about how the STM measurement probes uh, these Majorana states. And also the fact that where does this Majorana state actually lives? Does it live inside the iron or, but, or in the superconductor? And theoretically, it seems like most of the spectral weight of this Majorana is actually inside the superconductor underneath. And what we are doing is we are doing this constant current STM measurement where the tip follows this green trajectory. And that's how you're probing the wave function of the Majorana inside uh, the lead underneath. So if we combine basically this constant current condition with the calculation of where the uh, Majorana wave function is supposed to be, uh, we in fact, it's quite easy to reproduce this double I feature. And this is a feature that's not just at zero. We can also see other end states produce this exact same uh, phenomenon. And you can see this first beating is sort of the characteristic length scale uh, that you see from the theory, whether this is reproduced in the experiment or not. It's, it's hard to tell uh, at this point. This is our background uh, that we see right now. All right. Now, to confirm this idea that actually the spectral weight is living inside the superconductor, experimentally, we did another experiment. What we did was we basically evaporated iron and created these chains, but then we evaporated lead on top to bury the iron underneath the lead. This is kind of tricky to do because we have to anneal the surface to make a flat lead substrate at the end of your evaporation. And iron and lead have this uh, you know, bad relation. They like to like, segregate from one another. So if you anneal it too much, iron chain seems to float to the top of lead. But if you anneal it just right, you can get a monolayer uh, of basically lead on top of your atomic chain, uh, judged from this analysis that we have done of, of all these heights. And what's interesting is that we can still see the zero bias peak. So here's, uh, you can kind of see that there is a chain here uh, underneath this uh, uh, structure. Lead is everywhere. And this is actually a higher temperature experiment. Uh, you can kind of see that the structure we measure, this Shiba state structure, is not completely modified because we are probing it inside the lead. But the zero bias peak is very nicely seen at the end. And uh, this is some simulation uh, uh, that uh, uh, Jian Andres postdoc did. So this confirms the fact that the spectral weight is actually quite a bit inside the lead, uh, away from the iron chain. What is the lead? This one is one monolayer, we believe. 
just one monolayer. So it's not that thick, but we try to bury it more, and it's still we can detect it, but the pictures look really ugly. It just looks like a, a granular lead everywhere. I mean, it's kind of neat, actually. You can, you can tune your bias to zero, and even the lead looks granular, and you take an image, and you can immediately see where the wire is, because it just lights up underneath your, uh, in the sample. OK. Now, uh, let me now tell you about other experiments. So the first thing, uh, or the next thing we looked for is the fact that if you look at the Majorana, uh, it should have an equal mixture of electron and holes. And uh, the idea that whether you can probe this or not uh, was proposed by a group in Berlin, uh, basically using superconducting tips uh, to probe uh, this idea. And the notion is rather simple. Of course, if you have a normal tip, your Majorana shows up at zero energy. If you have a superconducting tip, the, you, know, you can't tunnel at zero energy. You can tunnel at the gap of your tip, which is delta, and of course minus delta. And what they showed in this paper is that if you do a calculation, uh, what you will find is that all these uh, other in-gap states, so this is sort of the gap uh, region, uh, all these other in-gap states uh, would be electron hole asymmetric, but the Majorana uh, should appear as electron hole symmetric. It's also another kind of a test as whether how close is this state to zero, because if you have a state that's just slightly far away from zero, the electron hole part do not have to be the same. So initial experiments looking for this was done uh, by the group at Berlin uh, from uh, Katharina Franke's group. Uh, these are the experiments. Uh, they did experiments at a slightly higher temperature at one Kelvin than what I'm going to show you. Uh, but they, they seem to see some symmetric and some anti-symmetric. It was sort of inconclusive. So let me show you our experiment at the lowest temperature. These are done uh, at sort of 20 millikelvin sample temperature. And uh, I can show you a whole curves, but this is basically what you measure uh, when you put the uh, STM right at the, uh, the eye of the Majorana, as I will call it. And what I've done is basically sh uh, taken the spectra uh, from the positive and the negative side and just flipped them and put them right on top of one another for you to look at. And what's nice is that here's uh, uh, 1.3 is the gap of the lead uh, and uh, the basically the substrate, uh, the tip. And what you see here is the edge of the gap uh, of the substrate. And all the in-gap states measured at the edge of the sub substrate, at the edge of the wire, the chain, uh, they're basically electron hole asymmetric, except the one at zero. So this checks out, and it, it's, uh, at least it's good news. OK. So now let me switch to the main topic that I want to talk about, which is, I guess, related to the topic of this conference, spin. <laughs> so let's think about spin polarization. Uh, and this is where things get very interesting. And there are several people here in the audience who have actually worked on this problem. So uh, Majorana, of course, have to be self-emission. So when you think about the uh, spin index uh, of the Majorana, with the electron a whole part, this thing has to have uh, the same spin index, up or down, whichever you like. So of course, this is different than what we're used to uh, with the Bogolyubov excitations having both uh, electron holes of, of opposite spin, uh, both of them being present. So, so the question is, what is, is there an experiment you can do uh, to test this uh, spin polarization? I mean, Majorana shouldn't have a spin, if you like, but it has a spin expectation value, just like it doesn't have a charge, uh, but you can do a charge experiment. Uh, Pascal sitting here in the front, you know, this is his paper in 2012 where he looked at basically something from the nanowire uh, uh, type calculations. Uh, but these ideas carry over uh, to all the different systems. And this is basically the polarization uh, of the Majorana coming at the end of the, uh, the chain. Uh, he and Patrick Lee basically considered the possibility of having a spin reflection uh, from uh, the end mode and basically uh, talking about how uh, you could use uh, uh, sort of ferromagnets to, uh, to probe the Majorana end mode or how this can be a source of highly polarized spin current coming out of uh, the chain uh, because the Majorana has a spin polarization pointing in a direction. Now what direction does that spin point to it depends on the spin orbit coupling and the Zeeman field in your problem. Uh, so in the nanowire world where the uh, where the spin orbit coupling is large, that determines quite the direction, toward also the direction of the wire. In our case, where the Zeeman energy is the largest, the Majorana polarization should be basically mostly along the polarization uh, of, of the magnetic field, the ferromagnet. 
So uh, I'll get back to you as we go along. Also, in the context of uh, TI uh, and vortices uh, and their core having Majorana zero mode when they are proximatized by a superconductor, there has been theoretical calculation about the structure uh, of the vortex bound state and, uh, and the fact that if you uh, could probe them with spin polarized STM, uh, you could see something that would be distinguished from ordinary uh, in gap in vortex bound state. And there is an experiment that was recently published which has some results uh, consistent uh, with this paper. Now the idea of spin and Majorana seems to gaining some uh, further traction beyond just detection uh, because people are starting to think about uh, you know, building structures in which you can couple Majorana to other things. And of course quantum dot with a spin is a natural uh, thing you can think of. And uh, there is now, I would say, a litany of uh, uh, theoretical papers out there uh, considering how you could transfer quantum information uh, through, uh, through a spin that's coupled to the uh, Majorana zero mode. And, and there are also notions of whether these experiments can probe somehow the non-locality uh, of the Majorana zero mode. So uh, this is a very much a hot topic and people are thinking about it. So we're going to use an STM to probe spin polarized density of state. Now I'm going to have to tell you a dirty little secret about STM, which is people who do spin polarized experiments usually hide. STM does its best to cancel any difference in the density of state. Okay? So if you have a situation where you had uh, basically a ferromagnet a chain like the one I told you, and you have a constant current, and you flip the magnetization of your, of your tip to probe the spin polarized density of state, what STM will do, uh, if it's an honest STM, it would, it would basically take the current and make it the same in both cases. So it actually cancels the normal state spin polarization uh, coming uh, from your substrate. Okay? Now, of course, it can do this, um, and let me show you, it does this in our experiment. So here are, are the chains uh, measured with uh, these spin polarized tips. Now these tips are slightly different than the tips I showed you earlier. These tips are being painstakingly made so to have very little magnetic field coming from them. They're actually chromium tips uh, with a very little bit of iron at the end of them. And that's important because uh, we're going to probe the superconducting spectroscopic property. So we don't want any field from this tip. And the way we check that is we go on lead and we make sure that we can measure the full gap of lead when we have uh, these tips. Now, you can find different chains. I told you some are up and some are down. So how do I know one is up and one is down? Well, one <coughs> appears at a slightly different height than the other, uh, depending on what which orientation is your tip polarization. And if you change the polarization of your tip, uh, to, you, to you this may not seem much, but this is like 10 or 20 picometers in which the height of the tip is changing. Okay? So in the energy window that I set up by doing tunneling experiment, I am trying my best, my instrument is trying its best to cancel uh, spin polarized density of state. So at first you might think this is bad news uh, because you know, if you look at, the, if you look at the, the, what, you know, the elementary okay, you know, calculation of tunneling current density of states, and you think you're going to use this instrument to measure uh, di dv, the tunneling density of state, to probe the spin polarized density of state as a function of energy, there is a very nasty normal state density of state factor in, in all of your data. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me just take a detour and say that actually some people use this uh, artifact to great advantage. Because so if you have a, so this is a current versus voltage characteristic on say one of these chains and you can see that the integral is kept constant. For example, this was the set point. But in the middle, the S, in order to keep the integral constant, if you keep the voltage very large, you can end up with all kinds of interesting uh, changes in the slope in your di dv. And if you're clever, you find a place with the largest change in slope and you set yourself that bias and you get a huge contrast in what the spin polarized states look like. And this is often used to prove that STM can probe spin polarized density of state. So 
we don't want to do that. So we want to actually stick with the fact that, okay, we are canceling uh, the spin polarization. But what are we canceling? We're canceling the normal state spin polarization. So let me show you how this actually uh, uh, works in the experiment. So this uh, chain that I showed you, I showed you, you probe it at two different heights. Now, I apply a very small field to make this normal, not superconducting anywhere. It's just a magnet. And you can make a measurement very in the low energy window, just near the chemical potential, and you can see that this, uh, this uh, uh, moving of the tip up and down makes these two values of the tunneling density of state basically the same. There's two curves that are exactly the same. It doesn't depend which direction is your tip. But of course, if I take into account that these are measured at different height, this corresponds to different density of states. That exponential factor uh, is actually 13% uh, change in this signal. Okay, so in principle, SDM should see nothing if it was just ordinary spin polarized density of state. So let's turn off the field. Let's let our Majorana appear at the end. And let's see what we see if we use to probe it with two <coughs> different spin polarization. So to our surprise, we found that if we probe the chains in the middle at zero energy, uh, we find you know, this is sort of like a features at down here where you get this sort of double peak structure that I told you about. You get no contrast coming from the, 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 the spin up and spin down measurement is the same. But now, if you go to the end, to the zero energy mode, uh, you find that there is indeed a actually a relatively large uh, contrast in the tunneling density of state, about 7% or 8% uh, in the signal, uh, which is telling you that the state at the end has a spin polarization. Now, I told you 50% of the chains point one way up and the other 50% point the other way down. So if I go to another chain, these two curves just get reversed. Okay? So we found that, oh, the Majorana zero mode at the end seems to have a polarization which is above the normal state which is being canceled by the instrument. So let me show you more details. So uh, uh, these are uh, basically tunneling curves as you climb onto the chain and come into the middle. So this is the zero mode that we are talking about, which is this feature. This is the polarization dependence of that zero feature. And you can see that the states, the Shiba states inside the gap, also show uh, some spin-dependent behavior. Okay? It's just a normal state background uh, that doesn't seem to show any spin-dependent behavior. So from that data, let me compute the polarization, which is conductance measured with the tip up, conductance measured with the tip down over their sum. Keeping in mind that all along what I'm doing is I'm, in, I'm forcing the instrument to keep the constant current in the same two condition. Okay? So the normal state background is just getting canceled by the instrument. So we see clearly that the Majorana at the end has a polarization which is rises well above zero, uh, you know, like seven or eight percent, depending on what tip you use. How good is this number? Again, depends on how polarized is your tip. It can change by easily a factor of two. But you can check it between different chains to know that it's the tip that's giving you the polarization difference. You can see that there is a polarization of the Shiba states away from zero, which becomes more clear if you go away from the end in the middle of the chain, and you can detect just the Shiba bands. And they have this very curious shape. One is going positive, and one is going negative. Okay, so this is zero. Now if I looked at another chain, uh, this could be the other direction. Polarization can just get a minus sign. So this is a generic feature we see. All right, so we went to our theorist friends and we said we think that there is something interesting going on here. So let's uh, figure out what's going on. So it turns out that this signal is actually a very good way to know whether you have a trivial state or a topological one. So let me back up and tell you about how we get trivial in-gap state in a superconductor. The simplest one, uh, <laughs> Sasha Balatsky is here. Me and Sasha worked on this problem 20 years ago where you put a, magnetic, a single magnetic impurity in a superconductor. So you start with a, a level that's partially filled. 
you put it on top of a metal, which becomes superconductor, those levels get broadened, this is Anderson model, and you look near the chemical potential and you see that there is more blue than red, so this is a magnetic impurity, and you zoom in there in the calculation and this gives you these Sheba states, in gap states. Now, uh, the reason the spectral weight of these uh, in-gap states can appear differently on positive or negative side has to do with where these levels are relative to the chemical potential. If this one is closer, spin-up state is closer, this one will be higher. If spin-down state is closer, this one will be higher. So this is one particular case. Now it turns out that these are delta functions, but the spectral weight in these states directly relates to the normal state background that you started with. Okay, so pictorially you can kind of think of it this way. You know, you have your normal state background, what's up, what's down, uh, you know, depending on what level is closer, what level is further away from the chemical potential, this one will be higher, this one will be lower, just like this is higher and this is lower. And of course, there is nothing in the theory that tells you that this zero energy st this state cannot be at zero, you know. Our zero bias state could be just some trivial Shiba state that just lives at zero energy. Okay, But what's neat about this is that it has exactly the same polarization as the background. Okay, So with this in mind, what you can do is you can ask your theorist friends to do a calculation which is to, to simulate what you would measure in the SDM experiment. Which means what? Which means not just don't tell me the spin polarized density of state, Tell me what I would measure if I keep the tunneling current constant when I measure that spin polarized density of state. So this is how you go from this signal to this signal. This is the spin polarized density of state. This is what you would measure with the tip that's up or down of this sort of in-gap state for a single impurity. Okay? And you can see that it has a very interesting feature, which is flips, flips basically polarization as you go across zero. And you can, you can compute the difference between them and now I think you begin to see where I'm going with this story. So if you have a, a trivial state, uh, basically you can show uh, that the trivial state, a trivial impurity state, has a polarization which directly relates to the uh, density of state, the normal density of state. And it's basically, it appears at some energy <coughs> related to the Shiba energy that you can easily tune to zero by hand. Uh, you know, Mother Nature could be unkind and it can do that to you. But what happens is that because of this, if you compute the spin polarized measurement with the STM, basically this thing has a symmetry it's, uh, that basically dictates that it has to go through zero at zero. So even your Shiba state can go to zero energy because it will have the spin polarization which is the same as the normal state, STM would basically see nothing. Okay. All right. So this is basically what we believe our experiments is showing. It's showing basically this zero energy peak uh, basically having a signal above the normal state background because if it was a trivial state, just like here, of course we have a signal at zero bias, okay, in the middle of the chain, but its polarization is basically going to zero in the middle of the chain. This is a trivial state basically broadened uh, by temperature. All right, so then you can, you, can, you can take this model, of course, this was just a, for a single site. You can make a chain. You can take that chain. Uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, five more minutes. Okay, perfect. I'm going to be done on time. You can take the chain and, uh, and look at not just the, uh, you, can, you can basically emulate the experiment. You can look at the Shiba band formed in a chain and the zero bias peak uh, from the Majorana. And you can basically uh, see that the, within this simple model, that I just described to you within a chain with say one band model of a chain uh, which goes topological with spin orbit coupling you basically start to uh, recover the experimental feature. Okay? And you know you can also get the polarization you know you don't have to look at differences you can look at the polarization and uh, this basically all matches the experimental uh, result. So in the last few minutes let, let's step back and ask where the hell does this come from? Okay, why is it that this Majorana zero mode has a polarization that's larger than the normal state background that you started with? Okay, well it turns out that this is directly related to the fact that the Majorana really comes from the fact that you have a band. Okay, 
So a trivial state comes from the fact that you adjust the local potential somehow to create a localized state. And all information contained in how you created that state is local. It doesn't know anything about anywhere, any, anywhere else. But in our topological business, you really need the whole band structure in order to create this Majorana. Okay? And it turns out that this spin information, when you go back to the model, you can actually begin to see uh, why would it have a polarization that not, cannot be canceled by STM. So let's consider a very simple model. Uh, this is a model which, which you have two bands separated by J. You have spin orbit coupling. Okay? And uh, you can ask the question, okay, now these are my uh, ferromagnetic chain bands. I put it on top of lead. Of course, these, uh, these, uh, these bands are no longer uh, sharp. They are broadened because of coupling uh, to the substrate. But you can ask the question, what is the spin of the Majorana? Well, the Majorana gets created at zero energy, and the spin information is just contained from these two points in the band structure. Okay, the points right at the chemical potential. And now if you ask, okay, what is the spin polarization of that state? Well, if there was no spin orbit coupling, the spin polarization of that state is whatever spin polarization of that band is. Okay? And this is kind of the key point uh, of where the Majorana spin polarization comes from. It comes from this original band crossing. There is a, there is a bunch of states crossing zero there, and that's what's creating uh, this spin polarization. And that's why the spin polarization is larger than if you integrated all the bands, if you like, even the points further away. Okay? And you know, you can, you can look at these model calculations. Uh, we'll have a paper posted soon where you can sort of see that you have a normal state background polarization and the Majorana can easily exceed the normal state background polarization because it's, coming from, it's property is coming from one of these bands uh, crossing the chemical potential. Okay. All right, so I think, uh, uh, let me skip these. Can I have 30 seconds? Yes. Okay. So let me just show you briefly that we are trying to extend uh, these type of experiments. And recently we've come up with the, you know, we're lo always looking for new platforms to create these chains and also, you know, create superconductivity with strong spin orbit coupling. Uh, recently, one of the additions to our lab is uh, just the home built uh, MBE machine, which we are using to create all kinds of uh, heterostructure type things. And let me show you just one thing. Uh, which I think is intriguing for you to look at. So this is uh, taking bismuth, which is a very strong spin orbit uh, system, and just growing it on top of a superconductor, in this case niobium. Now, of course, bismuth in a lot of circumstances can be superconducting, like when it's amorphous, but what we are interested in is when it is crystalline, and um, we can see that when you put it in contact with niobium, uh, you, can, you can basically induce a very hard superconducting gap of niobium into it. And of course, uh, we couldn't help ourselves, uh, but we basically started to see if we could cre create chains on top of this system. Uh, we don't know anything about the spin orbit coupling of this surface yet, but we, we presume it's going to be large because it's bismuth. Of course, it has a large superconducting gap. Uh, we can make these what we call iron pills or sausages. They're kind of a little fat. Uh, uh, they're not quite the atomic chains that we had before, but remarkably, uh, they seem to also show uh, the evidence of this zero energy mode, in fact, maybe even stronger, uh, appearing at the very end of these chains. And what's nice maybe about this system is that they induce superconductivity maybe even stronger uh, than what we had in the previous chains. So let me let stop there before Titus gets too mad. So uh, I, I reviewed for you just this, this entire platform, the, what I call the chart signatures. And I think that, you know, um, it's always a question whether these are trivial states. Somehow Mother Nature has been unkind to you. And I think that this spin polarized measurement uh, seems to be a way to at least uh, have a litmus test. If you don't have this signature, you, certainly what you're looking at is not the Majorana. So that's where we are. Thank you. <laughs>